Hello everyone and welcome to our final talk on the William A. Wars. It is the final talk. So where do we leave off last week? We left off, the second siege of Limerick has happened and the Jacobites are defeated. Patrick Sarsfield, who is now in charge of the Jacobite army, uh, wants to come to an arrangement with General Ginkle and he wants to stop and end the war. But he also wants guarantees from the Williamites. He wants guarantees that if he retires, uh, that his men can leave Ireland and go and fight for Louis the Fourteenth in France and, and other nations. So the Treaty of Limerick uh, on the 3rd of October 1691 is signed. Uh, and this secures all the things that Sarsfield was asking. Uh, very accommodating of Ginkle to do this, and certainly William of Orange gave Ginkle free reign to, to, to do this. So the, the Treaty of Limerick that is signed guarantees that the Jacobites can leave Ireland and go and fight in other nations. So this means you're taking probably around about 12,000 Irish soldiers and putting them into the war against William of Orange in, in Europe. But William agrees to this. So um, it, in a certain respect, comes back to bite the Williamites, um, and it comes back to, to bite the Allies in general, because the, the wild geese become some of the best foreign troops in Louis' army. And they prove themselves at many campaigns, but especially the campaign after the Williamite Wars, which is the Marlborough Wars or Queen Anne's Wars, they, they prove themselves, they are involved in the Battle of Blenheim, they're involved in the Battle of Malplanque, they're also involved in the Battle of Oudengard. So these are like big battles in the 18th century. This is in the early 1700s. So, yeah, the wild geese, as they become known as, the Irish immigrant troops, um, go throughout Europe fighting for armies in Spain, in France, in Germany, in Russia, even Austria and Italy. So you have many of these regiments, um, they become mercenaries in a certain respect. Um, the aftermath of the wars is that um, Ginkle uh, goes to the local land of Gentry uh, and, and they start making um, new laws. And one of the laws that comes about from this is the penal laws. And this is something, as a Presbyterian, that I, I would be totally against. The penal laws really stated, firstly, that Roman Catholics couldn't hold an R, uh, guns anymore. Okay, uh, But it also penalised uh, dissenters and Presbyterians. Unless you remember of the established church, which is the Church of Ireland, the Anglican Church. Um, you were you were penalised for this, and in the early seventeen hundreds, you have a mass exodus of people from Ulster to um, the New World, so to America, um, to Canada, and places like that. And later they go to Australia, uh, New Zealand, and places like that. But at this time, uh, it, it's it's basically you're really nearly outlawed as a Presbyterian. Your children, um, if they are baptised or christened in the Presbyterian Church, they, it's an illegal act according to the new laws. If you are a Presbyterian, you can't own so much land. You can only own tiny pieces of land. Uh, and there's also restrictions upon weapons as well. So this causes a lot of trouble. This causes a lot of trouble. The Western Protestant army that we've talked about and were proud of their campaign in, in Ireland, they're really disbanded now. Some of the regiments go into British service. So you have people like Tiffin's regiment become later the Enniskillen Fusiliers. Wolsey's horse later become the 5th Irish Lancers. Wynne's North Irish Dragoons become the Enniskillen Dragoons. So you have... Uh, all of this happening. So the, basically at the end of the Williamite Wars, Britain, there is a peace. It's called the Peace of Ryswick. And when the Peace of Ryswick is actually signed, 
uh, between the Allies and Louis XIV in 1697. There, uh, part of the piece of Ruswick is that Louis is accepting now that William is the king, okay? That William has the right to be the king of Britain, okay? So that's, this meant that the, the whole friendship between him and the Jacobites, it, it, it's broken up, okay? That the French are, are legitimising William of Orange and his claim to the throne. Whereas before they supported the, the Jacobite claim to the throne. So the Peace of Ryswick really um, finishes off James II and his claim to the throne. Okay. Uh, we have a few years of peace. And unfortunately, William of Orange himself then um, is, is riding uh, one of his horses. And the horse gets caught uh, on a molehill. And the horse, basically the foot goes down into the molehill. The horse throws William off the horse and William is severely injured. Uh, he's taken back to the palace and he's looked after by the doctors. Now in modern medicine, if what William, William Orange has suffered would probably be very treatable and he would recover very easily. But at this time, medicine is still only really getting to know um, about internal bleeding and things like this. So they are very draconian in what they do to William of Orange. Uh, and one book in particular, which I read, they basically said that it was the doctors that killed William of Orange. So William of Orange, unfortunately, dies of his wounds. And to this day, the ancient order of Hibernians uh, and many other Catholic um sectarian groups they whenever they're having their meetings and they have a toast they lift their glasses up and they said to the little man in the black velvet jacket well this is up to do with the mole because the mole threw William off the horse and killed William so this is how these people celebrate William of Orange by having a toast to his death so William of Orange is dead and the throne then William and Mary haven't had any children. So the throne would go next in line to the next Stuart and that would be Mary. But Mary's dead. Okay, William's wife is also dead. She died a few years before. So it goes to Mary's sister, Anne. And uh, as a Presbyterian, again, I don't really have an awful lot of time for her and her time on the throne. She was um, very much a supporter of the Anglican Church uh, against the, the dissenters and the Presbyterians in Ireland. Uh, and she enforces the, the penal laws with um, military might, basically. So Presbyterianism becomes this sort of secret thing. Um, similar to what happens with the Covenanters, many people are driven of, out of their areas. Uh, and this is where the, the saying, in the 17th century, there's a saying that Presbyterians become, become known as the Black Mouths. During the rebellion of 1790s, the Presbyterians are driven into the hills, especially where I come from, which is in North Down. Um, there's a place called Craig Antlet, and there are hills. And in the hills, there there's lots and lots of hedgerows and, and blackberries. So when they are brambles, so when the, the, the Presbyterians are driven into the hills, they're having to find and forage for food. So many of them are eating the blackberries and it stains their mouths. And this is why they become known, they become known later as black mouths. You're a black mouth. You know, so Presbyterianism um, starts to really um, try and fight back, okay, in certain respect. In, in in the early seventeenth century, um, as I say, Presbyterians are, are this is this is happening, and then sort of into the eighteen the seventeen forties seventeen fifties, they start to really fight back. Um, what happens is Britain's back at war again with France. Okay, in the seventeen fifties, this is the Seven Years' War, and there's a threat from France. There's a threat that the French may invade, and. 
Britain, Britain doesn't have enough troops. So they start forming these new uh, local regiments called militias and yeomanry. Okay. And they um, start to recruit people. Here in Ireland, you have your yeomanry and, and the militias. In Scotland, you would have the, the Fensibles, as they were known as. So you have all of these regiments are starting to be formed um, to, to protect the land. And then in the 1770s, of course, we have the American War of Independence. Okay, And many Presbyterians here in Ireland take great uh, comfort from what's happening in America because the people who are fighting in America are those people who left in the early 1700s. So you have the Tennessee Ulster, Scots-Irish, as they become known as. These are people from, uh, ten from originally from Ulster, who have only been there maybe 40 or 50 years in, in America, and then they, they bring in these laws in America, which again starts to penalise people in their faith. And America was meant to be a place where people could go and be free uh, and with their religious freedoms and liberties. So... They start fighting back, and some of the first people to join the, in, in the American War of Independence are, are the, the Scots Irish Presbyterians. And you have the Battle of Kings Mountains, a very famous battle uh, during this time. Um, so, what happens is in Ireland is, is a lot of soldiers from these yeomanry regiments and, and, and the Fensibles in Scotland and, and the militias join up the British Army to go and fight against the Americans. And around about Three and a half thousand Irish soldiers leave um, to go to America. And this leaves a big gap in many places. So again, local regiments are raised again for the defence of Ireland um, against the French and against the Americans. Because even a famous American privateer, Paul Jones, comes in to the... the area here in, in, in not far away from Belfast and actually fires a couple of shots um, in Belfast Lock. This is a privateer, an American pirate ship basically and the British respond with a ship and they chase him out to sea. So the Americans are getting bold, they're even coming into the Irish ports and they're coming in to try and attack you know, British um, British transport even they're trying to attack the British ships that are going back and forward and stuff so there's a lot of this going on um, so there's new regiments are raised okay and this is this this is the 1770s so what they're doing is they're trying to replace the men who have left Ireland okay and they don't have enough men originally they ask for it, it's originally just Protestants because of the penal laws but eventually then they start adding Catholics in Okay, and many regiments are formed. Around about 40,000 men answer the call in Ireland at this time. And this means that you have regiments now of Catholics. Okay, and this is not happening. The Presbyterians aren't happy. The establishment isn't happy. And many of the regiments are disbanded within weeks of being formed. And the problem with it is the Catholics don't hold, they don't hand the guns back in again. Okay. And there's a lot of sectarianism is built up now. You've got Catholics that are armed. You've got Protestant groups that are armed. You've got militias. You've got yeomanry. But you have a lot of people who have guns now given to them by the state. But they can use them. So sort of defence associations, similar to what happens in 69 in, in, in Belfast. These defence associations start forming. So you have things... Um, people like um, the on the Catholic side of things, they, they call themselves the Bunker Hill Defenders. Okay, Bunker Hill is a famous battle during the American War of Independence, and the Catholics here they see it as a great uh, victory over the British. So they use this, and then they eventually take a Bunker Hill bit off, and they're just called the Defenders. And these are the biggest group of Catholic um, vigilantes in the land. And they start attacking Protestant buildings and Protestant houses. And they, they try to take um, financial gain from this as well. On the other side of that, you have the Protestants um, who are armed as well. And they want to go out and enforce the law, the law being the penal law. So what they want to do is they, they go out first thing in the morning um, at the break of day. And they take guns 
from Catholic houses uh, and give them back to the, the government and to the law. And these guys become known as the Break of Day Boys because they're going out at the Break of Day. Or later on, the Peep of Day Boys. Okay, So you have these massive groups of Catholics who are armed, the defenders. And you have massive groups of Protestants. You have the militia, the yeomanry, and you have the Break of Day Boys or the Peep of Day Boys. Okay, And you have groups that have been you know, like this for years. You have the Hearts of Oak guys that are in Armagh and, and South Antrim. You have the the Steel Boys of, of Armagh and Antrim. These are all Protestant militia, Protestant groups, okay? Many of them have Masonic links, okay? And they, many of them are members of the Masonic. And there's a lot of sectarianism going on. And a, a poor man is a minister and his wife, a Presbyterian minister and his wife, are coming back from a service and in a place called Rich Hill and a group of defenders stop them and they attack them and they they beat them near to death. The man survives but the woman actually succumbs of her wounds later on. This builds up even more sectarian hatred between the two groups. Okay, so there's a place in Loch Gall, it's a very famous place now to us all, Loch Gall was mostly Protestant and there's a place just outside Loch Gall, probably about a mile outside of the main town of Loch Gall called the Diamond. And it's about 12 small buildings, including a tavern. The tavern was owned by a man called Dan Winter and it is number one, the Diamond Loch Gall. And it's, the building is still there to this day, friends, and if you ever want to come to Loch Gall, I'm actually a member of the Loch Gall Committee. Um, of the dam of Dan Winters College. So, uh, anybody wants to ever come and do a tour, um, of the original building at the Battle of the Diamond, just give me a private message or give me a ring. Um, so I'll give you my numbers and stuff at the end of this. So, um, basically, the what they do is, it 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 comes down to it that the um, defenders. They see these this area as a place that should be attacked, okay? And even more so when one of their own members is attacked outside the tavern at Dan Winters. And he has to go in front of the magistrate. Some people say Dan Winters is a Shabin. It wasn't a Shabin. It used to pay, it had the, well the reason we know it's not a Shabin is because it paid taxes, okay? And... They they wanted to take his license off him because of what was happening at the time with the people day boys um seemed to be congregating around his tavern. So we know he has a license and we know whether he's paying taxes on, on alcohol. So Dan is, is he's just he's a big typical big Ulster man, likes his beer, um he's a member of the, the local Masonic order. So the, the all these guys are meeting and they're having they're having meetings and everything else. And this defender, as I say, he gets the he gets a bit of a doing, as we would say in, in Glasgow. And he gets chibbed. And uh the next thing is the defenders find out about this and it's in all the papers. Um, because Dan has to go in front of the magistrate um and they're going to revoke his license, but he talks them out of it. So Dan, um, he, he he sort of lets things go and he tells the guys, look, stay away from the tavern for a while. And then in August, they they hear that a massive group of defenders are coming and they've, they've found pamphlets that they're going to attack the tavern. And there's a place called Anak Moor, which is just outside Loch Gall. This is where the defenders are meeting, okay? And they have this great meeting there. And there's around about two and a half thousand of them. And the local landowners, a guy called Atchison, who's a, who is a Protestant, he goes out and speaks to them. And they're nasty to him. So Atchison has his own regiment, his own group of, of men from his land who are armed. And uh, Atchison says, if you don't move, then I will fire upon you. And, and the defenders are nasty to him again. So he moves back closer towards Loch Gall and he alerts the other landowners in the area. So there's a man called Colonel Blacker 
and Blacker has also got uh, his own group of men who are armed. And the, he writes to another friend of his, a man called uh, Werner. He becomes very famous later on because he's involved at the Battle of Waterloo. Okay, so Jim, James Werner, um, he brings men as well. And he actually has a friend who is a militia officer in Mayo. And he writes to him and the men from Mayo start coming up towards Ulster as well and towards Loch Gull. So there's going to be a meeting of, of, of groups. Then the People Day boys, they, they write out to all their members in the areas. So on the night, uh, the, 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 what they call defenders come into Loch Gull and they start shooting at Dan Winters. Uh, and Dan's only got his own musket, but it's not enough to hold back of around about 250 of them. And they're firing into the thing and then they're throwing lit torches up onto the roof. And if you go to number one, the Diamond Lock Gold today, you will see the scorch marks still on the roof from where the thatch caught fire when the, when the Defender Catholics threw lit torches up onto the roof. And... As I say, anybody wants to go to the house, please private message me. So, basically then Dan gets out the back window and takes his two children up the hill uh, to the Diamond Hill, which is just about 450 yards from the house. On the top of Diamond Hill are the People Day Boys. Okay, And the People Day Boys, many of these guys were from some of the disbanded militias, okay? So they're trained how to use their brown bass muskets. And Blacker is coming from one way and Werner's coming from another way and they intercept massive groups of reinforcements of Defender Catholics who are trying to get the lock call. And their men fire upon them and there's a, a, a skirmish that goes on. Then we have a charge of the defenders into Loch Gall, into the Diamond, into Dan Winter's cottage. Uh, around about 600 of them charge into the place and they're received by the People Day Boys and their muskets firing upon them. Then the People Day Boys and the man in charge of them get the men ready and then they march down the hill towards the Jacobites. Well, the defenders. I keep calling them Jacobites, but they're the defenders, Catholic defenders, as they call themselves. And there's a massive fight. Muskets getting whacked in the faces. Swords being drawn. People being killed. And the defenders run away. Okay? At the end of what becomes known as the Battle of the Diamond, 45 Catholics lie dead. And not one Protestant. So the Battle of Diamond is won. There's a myth then. Of, of, of a story that comes about then after that. That there is an orange meeting. Or a, a meeting held in Dan Winter's cottage. Number one the Diamond. Um, there's no evidence to prove this. Okay. Certainly the building was, was massively involved. In, in, in the uh, Battle of the Diamond itself. But the actual meeting that was held in there, there's there's no evidence of it. Another building around about 600 yards away from the cottage, which is also owned by the Winter family, um, is reputedly where the meeting was held. Again, there's no evidence of this. But where there is evidence of a meeting being held is Sloan's Inn, which is actually in Loch Gall itself. And some of the... The People Day Boys were, were part of a thing called the Orange Clubs, okay? Um, and the Orange Clubs came about basically from all these Protestant societies getting together. All these people wanted to band together, okay? But many of them were also members of the Masonic Order, okay? And basically you have a group of people from both the Orange Clubs and the Masonic Order meet in Loch Gall. In 1795. And they get together uh, in Sloan's Inn. And I'm going to read you out the name 
of the, the men here. So landowners from the local area came together and it, the claims are that a man called James Wilson, a wealthy landowner and farmer and a, and a member of the Masons, along with Isaac Jeffs, who's a local guy, and two brothers called Dilly, and a few other people who are not named, met in Sloan's Inn. And number one warrant was, was then given to them. And they brought together the name of the Orange Clubs, and they brought the together with the name of the Masonic Lodge. They took the first and last, and they became the Orange Lodge. And that, my friends, is where the Orange Institution was born. The first warrant was handed out, and then within six months, you have eight warrants then handed out. A warrant is given out to every lodge. It is their sign of your authority. So that, my friends, was the start of the Orange Institution, the worldwide organisation, which I am a proud member of, and I know many of you are too. Listen, thank you very much for watching me. I'm just taking this uniform off me. Thank you very much for all the support that you've given to us in Jers TV. Uh, it has been tremendous uh, for me personally, the, the, the support and, and the amount of messages that I have got um, doing these talks. It has been a, a big honour for me to do these talks. And the reason why I do these is, is for education, for people to understand. But in the end, friends, we're all one thing. And that's what we are. We're all Glasgow Ranger supporters. Okay. Glasgow Rangers to me is more than just a club. It's a family. It's a friendship. I have become great friends with everybody at Jers TV. I have had so much support and, and, and so much help from many, many people in Jers TV. It has helped me to get through this COVID-19. Um, doing these talks it keeps me active I usually work with special needs children and young adults and for me not to do that job which I've done for over 15 years it has been a real strain upon me but doing these talks and, and providing these the, the, the information has been a great uh, source for me to, to basically keep away the, the demons I would like to thank especially Sandra from Jers TV, Sai from Jers TV, uh, Jim from Jers TV, but most of all, David McVigar. David is our technical guy, does all our editing, does all the work. David, I have to say, mate, thank you for all the help that you have given me. And it has been a great honour to work alongside you and, and we're going to miss you. Because Davey's going back to work soon. Um, so we're going to miss you bro. Um, hopefully you'll contact us even when you are away. Um, but you know we're here for you anytime. With the amount of work that you've done for us this year. And we've been doing a lot of work recently friends. And I hope you can watch the for the County Grand Lodge of Glasgow. Um, for their Orange Fest. And also for the Central Grand Lodge of Scotland for their Orange Fest, so please watch their websites, subscribe to their, their pages and uh, give them the support that you give us. I would like to thank everybody for watching. I would like to put on my colours and wish you all a glorious 12th of July. Keep your social distancing. We can still get through this. We have been through a lot more friends than, than this COVID-19, okay? As a people, well, you've heard it from 105 days of siege of Londonderry, two world wars, the sectarian murder and ethnic cleansing that hap was happening here in Ulster. I wish you all a glorious 12th of July and uh, remember King William. And remember more than anything that we are the people.
Thank you.